privileged and happy to have you in this episode of the Uganda Diaspora Show. And today we're going to tackle a very interesting conversation, one that um, oftentimes we or run away from, <laughs> or perhaps think that everybody's, it's obvious that some of these things, you know, you have to take into account. Uh, today we're looking at managing uh, personal finances, uh, saving for retirement, but I also want us to talk about insurance. And uh, it's one of those interesting conversation of, uh, conversations I've been waiting to hear and have with you people. Uh, otherwise, how are you? Uh, I, I overheard you guys talk about the weather. It is worse here as well. So global warming is such a big issue. Right. Uh, I want us to quickly get into it. And uh, there's lots of questions that I have lined up for everybody. Uh, but particularly, why is an issue, the issue of uh, savings, the issue of, we are told that... Um, you people abroad, for us who are here on the continent, we'll be looking at you people who are doing very well. Uh, you have made it in life. Everything is all right. Uh, but then challenges do happen, and especially COVID-19. We saw people, you know, dying, and then they have to be repatriated, and there were challenges. We have to contribute here and there. Uh, there's a lot. So let's start with the basics. Uh, I want to start with uh, this banker. Yeah, a banker, I'm sure a banker, you've had the story of Ugandans in diaspora and their savings. What is the experience, for example? Uh, the Ugandans in diaspora, are they, because for us, when, we, when you guys are up broad there, we're thinking, ah, these people are living like the Muzungu. So, which means you have insurance in place, which means you have... Uh, uh, you're saving like like the, the muzungu, which means you're banking your 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 money is like the muzungu. As here in Africa, it's, it's a totally different story. Uh, let me hear from you, Noah. How is the experience of Ugandans in diaspora and their savings, their personal finances? You know, Albert has been in community service. I've been in community service. Uh, I think the challenge when it comes to Ugandans when they migrate over here uh first of all it's like you know that transition is a tough one um it's it's kind of like you know it's a, it's there are so many things somebody wants to first of all like in economics we say like you know uh the best necessities of life that means housing uh that means like you know uh maybe they uh, like you know food clothing right so they they, so they, they want to make sure that those needs are covered. And, and also the other biggest challenge that uh, they have is that uh, when they are starting out, they are not making a whole lot of money. And, uh, and yet their responsibilities either have actually expanded as a result of migrating over here. That means like if somebody had a roof over their head back home, now they are having to pay for rent over here. Uh, so, so it becomes like, you know, a, a little bit of a challenge. That means they still have to maintain the family back home and they have to maintain the family here. So, so it becomes a little bit difficult for them to hit the road running with a savings culture uh, because they are still going to go through that process where they are going to, to adjust. So that has been one of the biggest problems, which means that as a result, they are not uh, taking advantage of things such as life insurance. Uh, they are not taking advantage of things uh, even like workplace saving uh, opportunities, like uh, for some of us who grew up in Uganda, we know about NSSF. NSSF is mandatory if you're in the private sector. If you are in public sector, you will get uh, a pension. Uh, over here, when they come, they are not working in government. They are all working in private sector uh, by the nature of their 
uh, by the nature of their immigration status. You, you don't easily just simply go and get it, uh, into federal government and, and start getting into those jobs. That means that uh, your first uh, place that affords you savings is going to be like NSSF. So we call those ones 401k plans. Uh, but most people will not understand what a 401k plan, including myself. When I got here and somebody told me, uh, wanna, uh, do you want to uh, save for F? Uh, like money in a 401k i uh, i said what is that is she said it is something uh where you save money for your retirement and i said don't worry about it i'll take care of that the person like you know because i didn't know what she was talking about like you know how how, how does that like i was like is that extra like you like you have nssf and then this is another one that you will have to put money uh, aside at least I had some knowledge of a 401. Okay. So, so with that, uh, that is one of the problems that we have. We do not understand those opportunities that are available for them. And therefore, uh, it, it, it's like, you know, there shouldn't be concern because uh, has got the advantage that uh, they had like maybe a financial background an economics background so thing is is not to judge people best thing is to try to draw closer to them try to explain the opportunities that are available for them okay thank you very much for that Noah. uh i like you you give us an, an intro into how you become uh, a Ugandan diaspora and then culture shock hits you of, of how to adjust around things. Um, allow me, um, ask Albert, you are an eco you're into economics, you're, into, you're working with the federal government and you're a community leader, most importantly. We also understand that uh, you have been in the US for a while. Where are the challenges? Why don't we Africans in particular, why don't we Ugandans in diaspora, why are we not good at saving? Do we even understand the reason and uh, the importance of saving, of the saving culture, especially the one that we have picked from, from, uh, from the Muzungu? Thank you, Lynn, and uh, good to see you again. Um, and uh, welcome fellow panelists and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you are. That's a good question. Um, and uh, I, I thank Noah for, for giving us that uh, um, build up of, of, of uh, reminding us of uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of, of basic needs uh, at the bottom. So when we are here, most of us, not all, but most of us, are in that lowest category. We're really fending. We just came out of uh, Uganda. We're here and we're fending for ourselves. We left families behind. We have dependents left and right. And we're also trying to figure ourselves how we fit in this new community. So yes, and Noah is right. So the first thing on our mind is not saving. It's really that survival where's the job because we think the, the streets of america paved with gold and you'll just come with a basket and keep collecting but it's not that way you come here you're lost <laughs> okay you're lost i actually joke i was like if i had the money and i had the ability i'll just pack a boeing uh, plane at airport uh, at the interior airport and say whoever wants to come come on and i'll just drop it right here and say okay now you're in america and see how they survive especially in winter <laughs> so it's it's not that easy so Noah has uh, made that good uh back, given that good background and they want to build on it so what should you do and i would rather take the question from there oh by the way i think you've introduced me and, and actually that's good i will leave my introduction that simple I'm, I'm a community leader i've been here for about over 25 years now so i'm a veteran here and <laughs> i've seen it all um so um Let's build on that. So what should somebody do? 
because now I'm speaking from the experience, my personal experience and experience of friends and experience of being a community leader, seeing people come in this community and leave this community back to Uganda. So what should somebody do? The first thing is to tap into the community of Ugandans that you've found. A good community. And by community, I'm not talking about community organization. I'm talking about personal relationships. It, it's, I mean, Ugandans were very resourceful. When you get here and you, found, you, you find Elin or Golda or Miriam, you can ask around. People will tell you, especially if you come here and ask me, I'll tell you who you can talk to in this community. I've lived in this community for 25 years. I know some, uh, one or two things about the community. I know one or two things about some people who can help you in what areas, what, when you're looking for a job, when you're looking to get into the system, if, if you want to join the federal government. I, I, I know the people that I can send you to. So that's the first thing you do. When you come, one of the mistakes that most of our friends uh, make when they come from Uganda, they get here, either they isolate themselves uh, and completely wall off. Some, uh, some, somebody, you, you meet somebody and they've been here for five years, they're like, really? I've never seen you in a community picnic. I've never seen you at a funeral. I've never seen you in church. Never... Where do you live? But they insist that they've been here for five years. So that person is really at a great disadvantage. Okay, so when you come, the first thing you do is seek out your fellow Ugandans. This Mzungu thing is, is a little bit uh, overrated. Uh, the Mzungu here is the Albert Bakasara from Kitumba in Fort Fort. <laughs> I'm your Mzungu when you get here, okay? So first, tap, tap into that network. And they're very good network. And they're very, even community organizations, they're very good community organizations that really help people when they come. Um, I could think of uh, Denver, Colorado. There's a young man there. He has a 90-day program to welcome Ugandans. He's a businessman, brings you in, gives you an apartment, sets you up for papers. Boston community where uh, um, Golda is, they, they have a very good network of helping Ugandans. People tell you what job you can do, even when you're a uh, 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 before they get set, <laughs> set up. Uh, it gives you a name of where they don't ask a lot of questions. They, put, they place you there so that at least you're not a burden. You're not sitting and eating all the little money that you came with from Uganda for, for, for months and months before you can get something to do. So that's the first step. The second step, now that you've set, uh, you're, you're settled in, you've got an, uh, your papers, whatever papers that allow you to get out of the house and drive a car and, and go work, when you are in that level, so you've moved up a little a step. But at that time, then it requires you to take, I'll call it a shift, a shift from the community responsibility that we assume in Uganda to an individual responsibility that the American system requires. In Uganda, if you don't have salt, you can knock on your door as a neighbor and, then, and the meal will not be <laughs> uh, inter interrupted. You don't have that here in the US. You assume individual responsibility for better or for worse. Okay, so that mentality that we come with, that does not allow us uh, or to think of, uh, um, I'll give you an, an example, since we're talking, this is a, like a business forum, I'll give you an example. And, and I would assume Golda will talk more about this because she's the uh, insurance expert. Ugandans don't get insurance here. That's the really, the, the example I can give you between best, I mean, community responsibility and individual responsibility. Ugandans here, they can spend money on beer, they can spend money on Muchuamo, they can spend money on everything, but no life insurance. And yet, it's not that expensive. That's because we have that community responsibility mentality that we come with. Ah! As, as the Baganda say, huh? my people will take care of me. <laughs> huh? When I'm dead, I'm dead. 
it's not that simple. When you're dead, you leave a lot of obligations and a lot of bills behind. So you're not dead, dead. You're really a burden in death. Why not take care of that when you have that belt and you're working? But it's, it's really a, men, a, a, a mental shift that is required to say, you know what? Now I have kids here. I have a home here. I need to protect my family. It's an individual responsibility that the American society requires. For us, we come, I, people will come. They, they, they'll bury you. They'll even bury you. They'll even love you more in death than uh, they did when you were alive. That's the mentality in Uganda. But it doesn't work here. It does not work here. So that's the shift where you shift from that, that cultural shift where you say, you know what? This, that was Uganda. This is the U.S. So that will be the second thing that is required. Okay, when you have that, now you start thinking, okay, I'm in this society, what do I need to do? Now you start talking about the things like the 401k, you start inquiring on investment opportunities, savings, and a lot of people, believe it or not, Lynn, do not cross that barrier. They never. That barrier is there even when somebody has lived here for 10 years, they still think as a Ugandan. I don't know how much of a Ugandan you are if you've been in America for 10 years, 10, 15 years. Okay, at least you should take the best of both worlds <laughs> and then kind of form, forge a unique uh, uh, perspective and, and th that models your, your, your life or that informs your, 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 your financial decisions. But uh, most of our colleagues do not get there. So I'll stop there and then when we come back and I'll add on there to see what other personal tips we can um, give and maybe when somebody lands on this um, uh, conversation they can uh, pick a leaf and people in Uganda who are uh, prospective uh, immigrants to this place have that knowledge before they got here because I can certainly tell you we did not or at least I did not have that information when I got here and what I'm talking to you is really out of experience of the things that yes. I didn't. Great. Uh, I'll come back to you and ask you how that went for you. But for now, uh, allow us to welcome uh, uh, Golda. Golda Namara is a licensed financial professional with the state of Massachusetts. Golda, uh, we need to talk personal finance management with Uganda diaspora. Uh, for us here on the continent, here in Uganda, we look at people abroad. This is being fancy. You people are, uh, you have made it in life. And we think you have adopted quickly. We think you're doing way, way better than us in terms of uh, personal finances, in terms of insurance, in terms of retirement packet, planning, and also packages, of course. But uh, we are often told that uh, most of the workers abroad, most of, of, of our people abroad, are a paycheck away from living in their cuts. How true is this, Golda? And where is the problem? How can we help? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, like uh, Lynn introduced me, I'm Golda Namara. I'm a licensed financial professional working with a World Financial Group, which is a, a brokerage in all the states here in the US and in Canada. Uh, yeah, so for me, basically, I, I was thinking of the solutions because uh, one of the major things that we do as a brokerage is financial literacy in the communities. And what I've discovered has been so, so, so alarming because you find someone has been here for even 30 years and they know nothing about how the financial system here works. They are still doing everything the way they used to do it back home. And unfortunately, because we learn from socialization, they are also teaching their children at home to do the same thing. You find that even children who have been born here are managing their finances the way uh, we manage them back home in Uganda. So this is like for everybody in the diaspora or even people back home, that the very first thing one should do before uh, they even think of making money is getting financial literacy. Because I also get uh, stories from Uganda, you know, where people are signing up for employment loans, they 
don't know the interest, you know, they don't know. Uh, the people are taking all kinds of financial decisions. You see, our honorable MPs back home in Uganda, they are the most highly paid, but they are most indebted group of people, you know. So the very, very first thing we can do as a community abroad or back home in Uganda is to get financial literacy on uh, proper goal setting for our finances, uh, proper saving, because, you know, you find someone has a savings account, for example, here in the U.S., they have had it for 10 years and they don't even know the interest on that account. And the bank is making some very good money. Let me say you have an account uh, where they are giving you 2% and the bank is lending that money to someone on a credit card getting over 15%. So thinking of proper ways or learning proper ways of saving proper ways of investing, uh, proper ways of wealth protection, like how do you really protect what you have built, uh, learning proper ways of wealth accumulation is very, very important. That is one, financial literacy. Without financial literacy, no matter where you are in the world, and shockingly, I <laughs> seeing uh, we also have a panelist here working in the bank, I've met people who are, who are even um, uh, brokers at Wall Street and they are not financially literate at all. At all. Yeah, so financial literacy. And then the second thing I think we can do, especially for us diaspora people, is to invest wisely. To know like what is an investment? Is it something, you know, when we are growing up, I grew up down in Rukunjiri where, you know, you used to hear young boys saying, you know, when I grow up, I want to build a house this big on that hill. Those are the kind of dreams most of us here in the diaspora are chasing. Someone builds a multi-billion house in the middle of nowhere just to fulfill that fantasy. And the unfortunate thing, the house could be in Uganda, and this person is raising a very young family here. So considering um, um, key futures of investment like taxes, tax advantage, like the protection that is on your investment, we have had so many cases of fraud here, especially in the Boston area. So many people have lost so much money in those fraud schemes in the community. You know, if I'm getting Getting my money and giving it to, for example, Miriam, what protection do I have on that deposit I'm giving her? Like here in the US, there would even be no excuse for you to give your money to someone in the community because we have so many financial products that can grow your money the way you want. So considering tax advantage when you're investing, considering protection, considering safety, like how safe is where you're putting your money as um, listening to a story yesterday of someone who bought very good land in Garuga, but she did not like fence it or something. And then she goes back to Uganda after six years and they have cut it off from six corners. Yeah, and some of the people who took part of it are soldiers. So like you're really investing where you're putting your money, is it safe? Like if it is here, we have so many groups, you know, those groups like um, like the ones they have in communities deep down in Uganda where you, you collect your money, you give it to someone and then that person, you know, you rotate. Circles, they're called circles. Uh -huh. So we have those ones here. There are so many and people have lost an enormous, enormous amount of money that if that person had sold a bank or an investment company, Shockingly, here all the banks even have investment branches that are sometimes even willing to give free investment advice. But still, we are managing our finances the way we used to do home, and it has cost us. And then on investment still, also we can look at growth. That where you're putting your money, whether it is in Uganda or here, sit down and see like 10 years from now, what do you expect? from there how is your family going to benefit even if the venture is so profitable like if you're raising your children here in the u.s like 
you find someone grew up in Uganda, they have an investment back home in Uganda, they themselves who grew up in Uganda are failing to collect rent from that investment, but they somehow have a dream that their children who have grown up here will go and collect rent from that facility. So considering the four key aspects of an investment, taxes, protection, safety, growth, is very, very, very important. And then the third uh, thing that we can look at as, uh, as people in the diaspora is having financial goals, like having financial goals which are specific, which you can measure, which are attainable, which are relevant, which are time-bound. This number one will save so many from fraud, especially the fraud in the community, because People are defrauded due to idle, uh, idle liquid cash, you know. Someone has been collecting so much money, they have like 50000 under their bed. So someone who's smart in the community comes up with some good scam, and it's all gone. But if you have financial goals, let me say, you're saving for your retirement, you're saving for a house, you're saving for your children's education, you're saving to do investments back home or here, it will be very hard for someone to come up with some cooked up kind of, you know, get rich scam and, and uh, take advantage of you. And then I'll, I'll share one more, I don't know. And then we can discuss and then I'll share the rest later. Another thing that has really kept us behind is instant gratification. Um, I normally hear from friends because I do like education at churches, uh, groups. Right now after this session, I'm going to meet a very big family group that I've organized to teach. And one of the main hurdles we have in our community is wanting to satisfy, to quench that thirst we felt back home in Uganda in just a short period of time. You want to get that Range Rover you have always dreamt of immediately, no matter the consequences. You want to get all those nice clothes you saw uh, on TV immediately, no matter the consequences. You want to do for your children all the things you see celebrities do for their own, even in your first year here in the USA. You know, you find so many what hurts me most is that it is us the impoverished community because to be sincere we the african immigrants and the spanish are the impoverished here we are the ones roaming around the malls today is saturday people wake up very early in the morning clean up and just run to the malls whatever they see i must get that for um research was done at stanford university uh, years back on very young kids on instant gratification. And they discovered that all the kids who they gave them like candies, like sweets. And they discovered that all the kids who wanted their sweets immediately, immediately to satisfy themselves there and then achieved nothing. That's the story of most of our diaspora folks here. You find someone has been here for 30 years and they have nothing. So I really think if we as, um, as a diaspora community can try to discipline ourselves, you know, try to hold back a bit, have a plan in place like where we can control emotional spending. By the way, the scams are also part of instant gratification. Because someone is telling you, you know, you don't have to wait to invest in fidelity for 15 years. No, I can do something here for you two years. You'll be a millionaire, chap, chap. And that's it. So I think uh, if we can try to manage the instant gratification, we can avoid scams and fraud. We can avoid emotional spending. We can avoid the stress that comes with the, the instant gratification, the regrets, and we can avoid debt to cause debt like we'll be seeing ahead here. Debt is a very, very big uh, hurdle, especially for us immigrants. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Golda, for that. Wow.
Wow, wow. Financial literacy. And uh, interestingly, Golda, this cuts across, you know, it's not only the Ugandans in diaspora, even Ugandans here in Uganda need that financial literacy. Many people are drowning in debt. Many people don't even know that their savings accounts are behaving the way they are behaving because of their, there's a whole lot. I think what you mentioned is very key. Uh, financial literacy is very, very important. Um, I want to ask um, uh, our NSSF uh, gentleman, Twahira Tadeo. Now, Tadeo, in the NSSF, before we get into NSSF, have you uh, encountered stories of poor community Ugandans uh, having challenges with savings, having challenges uh, especially saving within back home and also abroad because we know people abroad you have money you have big jobs you're living large you're okay uh, but let me get let me come to you Miriam what was your experience first of all we know that uh, you poor abroad you have your money you have documents you're working uh, but are there ch what what challenges apart from what Golda apart from what Albert and uh, uh, and of course Noah have mentioned what other challenges do we as Uganda diaspora have? Uh, like uh, the previous panelists have mentioned, the biggest challenge is uh, lack of knowledge of what to do. I remember the first time I heard about uh, the 401k uh, savings. I said, I am not interested in that. After all, I, I don't plan to stay here for any longer. So when you tell me about long-term savings, I'm not interested. That was my first reaction because my plan was just come, do whatever I want to do, just, just run back home. But it turned out different. So, uh, but I got, I got that opportunity to discuss that because... I was in an informed environment. I was working with a school, with a university. So I can imagine most of the Ugandan community, most the majority of the Ugandan diaspora community are people who are doing uh, uh, short term work, uh, temporary work, like working in factories, uh, nursing. And most of the time, they don't have like long-term contracts, you know, like the formal employment environment as we know it. So you are there, you are working today, you are hired, you are paid. Sometimes you work two weeks, sometimes you work months or whatever, but you are there temporarily. And then you are fired the next day or you just move on to the next available opportunity. So you find that that environment itself encourages like... Um, Working to satisfy the immediate needs, it doesn't even give you time to settle down and save if you are not, especially if you are not knowledgeable, you don't even have, you don't get the chance or the time to ask about uh, the benefits that could be there with your employer and uh, how they can help you save. You don't, you don't even... Uh, accumulate enough credit to attract your bankers to talk to you about the saving schemes they have. And if you do, most, most of the time you find that you have high interest because you are not like credit worthy. So if you are buying the car, it comes at a high interest. If it's, it's mortgage, it's at a high interest. So those are the biggest challenges, but it's especially so much of a challenge because people financially illiterate even when you have formal education are you financially illiterate uh, do you know what saving is do you know long-term uh, benefits of saving with a certain uh, financial institution do you know how to build your credit do you know how to um, invest in something whether remotely like stocks like whatever we don't know anything about such and I think all of us should take a deliberate effort to inform ourselves. Like we go out to seek information about our health, we should go out deliberately to seek financial information so that we save. Because I don't think if you are not like a professional from your education, this, the financial information comes to you naturally. It's not something you are going to read from a newspaper or hear from a TV station. It's something you have to deliberately go out and look for and, and put in your 
dream and know what benefits you and how you can achieve it. Okay. All right. Uh, let, let's just move on a, a little bit. I want us to talk about, uh, I want to come back to, um, to you, Albert. Yes. Albert, Albert, before we can talk to Noah about uh, what ha could have improved, uh, you're a community leader. This is most important. But what I was trying to say, Albert, is that you have been in the U.S. for a bit and uh, you are a community leader. My question is from what Gold has told us that the major problem uh, the Uganda diaspora have is a leader so far and uh, do you see any changes do you organize for example um, orientation uh, moments do you do you go out there out of the, of your way to, to educate people because this is key we are tired of organizing uh, uh, car washes we are tired of organizing uh, I, I don't know community bring come together and you know collect money for so and so to be brought back home all those things uh, I, I, we need to find the lasting solutions and i think it starts with you the community leaders um thank you so much lane um and thank you yeah um gola is absolutely right um on just to, to piggyback on what she said to have financial goals so financial goals are really life goals it's the life goals that drive the financial uh, decisions that we make. So what can we do as community leaders? Uh, she's out there in Boston, and I'm on, uh, Noah is in, uh, Miriam is in Ohio, I'm here in Washington, D.C. So we do, we do help people. And believe it or not, there are some people who, out of the, you're sitting on your dining room and somebody calls you and say, oh, no, no, I got your number from so-and-so, and they said you might have information. And sometimes we help them, and sometimes we just, send them in the right direction so that's the first thing i had said that when you get here tap into a meaningful relationship whether with a community leader people who can help you they are there okay if you are raving in boston golda is there but you will not know that landing getting off the plane it's by asking the people and say hey who is the person here i can talk to who is vast, well versed in abc and they put you there okay so again once you've settled here then it's the life goals that drive you if you've gotten married and you have young kids, I completely agree. An investment of a mansion in, 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 in Rukunjiri or even Kampala, it doesn't matter how prime the, <laughs> the area is, it's really not an investment. You have those personal responsibilities that I talked about in the beginning. So now you have an immediate uh, challenge to raise a young family, to protect it, to protect it financially. The investments in Uganda should kind of go on the back burner. I'm not saying, hey, if you find a good piece of land, don't buy it. But as Golda said, if you buy it, make sure it is in an area that you can protect, not next to some general who's going <laughs> to put the fence around it and, 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 and make it his or hers. So those are the decisions that we make. Um, as community leaders, I mean, I, um, um, you, you introduced me as the community leader, but maybe I could give some um, background to, 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 to the panelists. Um, I'm a I've been in this, I was a youth activist because I got here as a very young man. And then I was a founding uh, uh, chairman of Tor American Association. That's an organization that some of you might have heard of. It's still going. Then I had a stint in UNA as, as their deputy speaker for a couple of years. And last year I, I ran and uh, that's a whole different story, but I was unsuccessful in uh, in, in taking the helm of the organization and, and 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 really what we wanted was not power or money or anything it, it's exactly what we're talking about here how could we turn an organization that unites ugandans away from this nonsense of partying on labor day weekend and spending half a million dollars on, on nonsense how do we empower how do we turn into an empowerment forum for our people both here and in Uganda. So those are the, the, the challenges for the, for, for, the, for the community here and the leaders especially. We need that getting together. We need that getting together. We need that these values of here in the US are, are any superior to our values. I actually do suggest, and I will say this over and over again, 
pick what is best in both cultures, bring it together. We have good values that our parents instilled in us when we were growing up in Uganda. Bring those. Now pick some good capitalistic investment, as God is saying, these values here that will help you provide for your family, provide for your community, and empower you. Um, I have, um, uh, from my business training, and yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and to have the financial literacy that uh, God is talking about. I do have an MBA in, in finance. So, but that's a piece of paper. What? How do you practically? Uh, how do you uh, interpret it practically in your life? Or how? How? What tips can I give here for some Ugandans uh, um, to, to use? I would say three things. Measure what you value. If you're spending, take a moment. Go in your bank statement if you can see where you have spent your money. This is like a self-help kind of financial literacy that can be complemented by a professional like Golda. But you can do these things on your own with, before you even get there. What do you spend your money on? Take out your bank statement, look at it, and see where have you spent your money. And if you have spent your money on things that don't matter and they don't value them and not consistent with your life goals, they're not consistent with your young family, they're not consistent with where you want to be, that would be your first step in carrying out the stuff you don't need. The second one, value your time. In economics, they have this concept of... Uh, Opportunity cost. <laughs> and, and this is like lost, uh, and I'm not knocking uh, uh, um, um, people in, in Uganda, but this is a complete foreign concept in Uganda. Okay, opportunity cost is a complete foreign concept in Uganda. Okay, you would find, I used to laugh at my mother who earlier and then stay there the whole day and then wait in the evening to get 2,000 uh, shillings for transport from the politician. And I look at her and I say, but you're my mother. You, you could have spent your time better sitting at home or even digging a garden for $2,000 the whole day. But in Uganda, people do that. Okay? And when we come out of that environment and we get here, you find our brothers and sisters making the same decisions. Some of us say, oh, Gasoline is very uh, cheap in some gas station five, six miles away. And then, but you, you, you calculate on how much time they will spend on the road. And, and Really? And there's no, no, no savings. So value your time. Value your time. If, so if there's a nonsense that is going to take you the whole day, put it in financial terms and say, okay, I'm going to wash a car. If the car is very, very dirty, it's going to take me a whole hour. How much money do I make an hour? How much does a car cost to, <laughs> to wash? And you'll find out the better deal is actually go give, give somebody $25 to wash your car. Okay, so again, value your time. How do you spend your time? And how does, the first, how, how does that translate into the losses? Okay. You, again, what, what did I say? I said uh, this is a foreign concept in Uganda, and it is. You find somebody spending three, four hours in traffic. Yes, it's not their problem. Maybe the city could plan more. Maybe the government could actually do better. But it, who is the government? It's the people. If you don't have that concept of opportunity cost, you're going to get in government, and you're not going to plan for the city. But honestly, think of the economic cost to the country of the jams in Kampala where people don't get where they're going. Instead of supplying a, a, a lorry of mango and dropping it off and going back and getting another one and bringing it back whole day, one lorry of matoke makes it into the city center. Think of the economic loss. And the other matoke is ripening and in Ilkunjiri and, and, and Kabarole and, and then it's, it never gets to the market. It's not like it doesn't have a market. It just never gets there. Because we don't have that concept of opportunity, you know, uh, opportunity cost. The last, the third one, cultivate meaningful relationships, and this is where I started off. 
who are your friends? Who do you talk to? What do they impart into you that is valuable that you can use? And I'm not saying this, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this is easy because some of us are in our shells and you don't want to make new friends and we are uh, uh, distrustful of, 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 our, of our colleagues and you meet a new person and say, like, what, what, what do they want from me? That kind of stuff. But honestly, build meaningful relationships. I'm talking to you now. This is my relationship group. Look at, look, look at the steam people I'm talking to. This evening, uh, I have an, uh, a, a get-together. I'm going to be sitting with a couple of people from World Bank. I'm going to be sitting with a couple of friends. We're going to be about five, six, seven small group of people having dinner and drinks. But that's the opportunity cost. The value of that conversation where you have people from who can impart something into you, okay? Yeah, you can have your friends here and there who you joke around and play around and, and do the nonsense with. But that should not be your life. Okay, if you do that, do that once a month. But the other four Saturdays, find out. Call a Miriam, call a Lane, call a Golden and have 15 minutes of their time. Hey, Golden, checking on you. Yeah, I was thinking, I'm bounce an idea off of her. Usually people pay these experts for a lot of money. But by the virtue that you happen to come from Uganda, the woman will talk to you and you'll end up getting a $300 worth session for free. So build meaningful relationships. Again, I'll repeat to them. Measure what you value and how you spend your money. Because if you, if you care about something, you have to measure it. If you don't, then that's fine. Then you will never even know where your money goes. Okay? All right. Um, value your time and then build meaningful relationships okay thank you very much albert uh so Dale, i hope things are okay with you right now uh if you remember our question earlier uh let's talk let's talk financial management and also available opportunities in uganda and uh, from what you've had so far uh the experiences and what more can you add on this uh, Lynn, thank you so much, and the, my fellow panelists. This is a very engaging and insightful moment. Thank you for inviting us as NSSF, but me in particular. Um, Golda really understands uh, pretty much what is happening in the minds of many Ugandans. And actually what happens with Ugandans abroad is the same as what happens locally. I also used to think that people, when they go abroad, they probably come back with a better way of thinking about finances. But unfortunately, when they come here, it's even worse because uh, the only thing they learn about Uganda is they see these, these little girls partying, uh, you know, taking these false selfies in places where they cannot even enter. And they actually think in Uganda we are just eating money. In Uganda, there is no money. So when those people come here, you see they have a lot of appetite to spend. And that's really uh, bad, especially for people like us who are in, the, in this particular sector. Uh, as NSSF, we've had uh, a great experience. I get a lot of colleagues who are in very many other countries, out, uh, not necessarily in America, Dubai, Sweden, and you guys are all facing the same problem like we are facing here. A Ugandan is somehow grown up in a family where, you know, the moment there is money, that money must be spent. Uh, unlike our colleagues who we have stayed with for a long time, the Indians, we are not learning anything from them, especially in terms of frugality and how they handle their finances. For us, we are still stuck in our traditions that the moment you know, they keep coming up with all forms of uh, slogans. Eh? You know, now the most trending one is if the money you have can solve the problems you have, eat it. And, uh, you know, that's, ev that's what every young person is going through. And that's what they do over the weekend. Uh, I want to advise, uh, just to add on what Gold was saying earlier, Especially people, we, as NSF, we came up with a financial literacy 
campaign and we actually have constituted it into a department and one of the things we are realizing is people even those ones who are working with financial intra uh, institutions they are financially illiterate i find so many guys from bank of uganda from you know the guys we think are driving this economy when they are getting towards retirement and you ask them what next they have no idea someone comes and draws a, 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 a billion shillings or two billion from nssf because as you know uh, and we are, we've had some relative peace in the country people's salaries are being high so like and because nsf has forced them to save without drawing up uh, somehow many people have big monies in nssf and uh, you realize that when they come and get this money the only thing they can do is to quench their appetite on extra women, extra liabilities. You find a, a man who is almost clocking 55 years and is still um, producing children in an environment like Uganda. You just understand that it's a whole fa uh, facet of things that we need to manage in this financial literacy arena to ensure that people understand, especially retirement uh one of the things I've, I've taken note of most of the things gold i was saying and i think i will be listening into the recording um but one thing that i also want us to add on what she was saying when you guys meet young people especially the ones who still have responsibilities there are two things when we are investing money you are either investing to accumulate or you are investing to appreciate. Now, when you still have responsibilities of taking children to school, paying rent, managing here and there, you must involve, invest in assets that are going to give you constant flow of money so that in the event that there are circumstances like how COVID came, job loss, ailments, you have a way to continue surviving. Then, as you as you manage the as you you get so many of these um, uh, small incomes coming in and accumulating over time, now you can start thinking of investing in assets that appreciate. Now you can go into things like stocks. You can invest into things like land. Let me particularly speak about land because many of you have heard you speak about this thing. Many of my friends, especially who come from Western Uganda. I've seen them, the moment they get their first salary or the first loan they get, they want to build a house in the village. I don't know what they do there, probably to to a statement that I am making money in Kampala. But you have just established another liability for you because you are now going to get a boss to manage your asset. That guy who sleeps in your house, he's the one who calls you every day where power is off, water is not running. So who is the boss of the other? Actually, that guy is your boss because he's commanding you every day on, and, and you are there a slave of that person you have built that house for. So it is happening so much in our communities that you get money and the only thing you are thinking, you are thinking liabilities, liabilities, liabilities. So I want, to, I want us to, to add a voice on many of those people, if you have built, you have bought a piece of land, say in Kampala or around Kampala, make sure you have a plan to develop that land so that that land becomes income for you. Otherwise, if you leave it there idle uh, with the hope of appreciation, which is largely speculative, because remember, you're only going to say, I'm going to buy this land with the hope that in the future it will be this much. What if it is not? Yet, if you build rentals there and maybe you know you're getting a 50,000 there or 500, then you know you have added on your income streams and that's going to do you uh, pretty much better than actually having assets around that are not adding value uh, to you. What we have done for the people, especially in the diaspora, and it has been informed by the stories that I keep getting on my desk, uh, like uh, Lynn, sorry, um, Miriam, might have introduced me. I work with the NSF voluntary department. So what we are doing here is, remember, many of you know NSSF as a forced saving for people in the private sector. Now, the voluntary contribution allows anyone who is a Ugandan 
to now voluntarily save into NSSF because either way, we are all going to face this future together. We are going to retire in this same country. And we believe that if you can have some money put aside, especially with a trusted organization like NSSF, and the, when I say trusted, I don't want to, to take it literally. I want you to understand it from the financial perspective because you are all financial experts. NSSF is guaranteed by government of Uganda. So whatever Mystic City does, you have a guarantor who is a government. So you are safer investing in such uh, an, an organization than, in, than throwing your money in many other things that keep coming up and you don't know actually who guarantees uh, your safety. So what we are doing for with the guys in the diaspora, one, you guys have a, a very big problem. You save money in, I don't know, uh, that 401 pay scheme. However, when you are leaving, I don't know why many of you are unable to claim that money out of it and many other areas where you save it. I don't know how it happens in the US, but I have worked with many guys in the Scandinavian countries, guys in South Africa. When they are leaving, they are unable to bring that pension back home. And some of them say, I'm tired of living in that area and I want to retire in Uganda. And remember, we do not have agreements of exchange between those, those countries. So what we have done, we are writing to those schemes. We write with your consent and we ask them to transfer your money into NSSF so that in the event that you are going to retire here, that money can come and we sit, but we guarantee them that once it is here, we will not give it to you until you say you have made the 50 years of age or when you are sick and unable to work, which things are prescribed by the International Labor Organization. So we meet those standards and we tell them that once your money comes here, we shall not give it to you unless you have a social security issue. But most importantly, um, right now I want to share with you that the highest saver in NSSF is actually a guy who works out of Uganda. I will not mention his name, but what he did is when he was still here, he had an NSSF account, which you can also open even if you are not here, as long as you have a national ID. He has told his employers, wherever he's working, that please send my money to NSSF. This is what it has done for him. This guy now is the highest saver with 6 billion shillings. What does that tell you? That means if this guy, every time we declare interest, okay, let's say uh, for the past 11 years, we have not declared interest, which is below 10%. That means if we declare this year a 10%, that guy will earn 600 million of money into his account. And that means this guy, even if he retires today from the diaspora and comes, on average, he has, say, 2 million shillings at his exposure to spend every day, even if he decides to live for another 200 years, which he cannot do. So I want to encourage people in the diaspora, as much as you can, why, why do we need, by the way, why do we even talk about these things of telling people that save your money with a pension scheme like NSSF? Because in these schemes, you, are, you have tax advantages that all the money we will get or give you as interest will not be taxed and we will not also tax you when you are drawing it out. So that means you can have a free ride with your finances and now just have a, a point where you know if I retire at this point probably I'll have this much and it's going to do you so much good. What does this money do for you? Rather than you invest in a fixed income, a bonds, and maybe real estate. NSSF invests in all these assets, but optimally, we make sure that we maximize the advantages that can come out of these asset classes. And that's why we are able to come up with the interest that we give you every year. Yet you as an individual you may not have the knowledge to invest in real estate, the knowledge to invest in bonds, the knowledge to, to invest in equities. Now, these experts help us optimize this and then you are able to get uh, an adequate return at the end of the day. So what we want to especially sell in the diaspora, we have gone into the real estate area because we have seen that you people 
you keep buying land here and you buy air now at least you come to nssf we keep advertising on our website we show you which estates we are developing you can actually come and buy those assets if you think they are going to make sense for you but we'll also advise you whether according to the age where you are you need to buy into real estate or you could go into other asset classes so that you can maximize uh, the profit out of them so thank you so much lynn uh, i'll be waiting for other engagements thank you thank you very much uh, tadeo for that but before you leave before you leave uh, the floor uh, i was reading about uh, offers that uh, uganda has in terms of uh, savings and, and 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 retirement for people in diaspora and i came across nssf diaspora connect what is that? Briefly tell me about it. What is NSF Diaspora Connect? <coughs> Sorry, I have a cough. Uh, Lynn, actually what we are, we are doing with the Diaspora Connect is exactly what I've been mentioning. We have now given an opportunity for people who are working in the diaspora, but in their mind of minds, they know that they are going to retire in Uganda. And I have told you we have two areas. One, open up an account with NSSF. So in the diaspora, the diaspora connect was actually a way of how can that money get into NSSF. So once we give you a number, you can use your card, you can use your bank. And unfortunately, many of the communities are unbankable, either maybe because people don't have papers or some, some kind of thing. But we also know there are very many former Ugandans who are working in the diaspora. So we can start with those ones. Those ones who are unbankable, like um, I think Albert was mentioning earlier, where you are in, you are able to have these people into a community, and then they remit that money, and we, we receive it as a as a block, and then we just have a breakdown of who, whose account do we credit. We can also receive it so that we can allow people in the diaspora save back home uh, into their pension. Why is this important? These are all financial experts and they know the reason actually those countries where they are, are developing is because pensions give an opportunity for long-term capital. So industries can borrow and create jobs. Now here, unfortunately, the biggest borrower is government. The biggest borrower is government simply because uh, the, credit, the, the, the price of credit is too high and the people down there cannot handle. Now, we think if we continue to grow these retirement funds and we have a lot of capital available, even if government is chasing too much, when government is chasing too much money, definitely the rates will go low. And that means many industries will be able to start up, borrow cheaply locally, create jobs for our brothers and sisters who are here, and then also continue to grow. It's... Um, it's a cyclic process that we think that if we all put together our effort as Ugandans, both uh, abroad and internally, we can actually be able to make Uganda a better place. So those guys can actually now uh, just join. I'll share with you the links. If anyone wants to join NSSF or transfer the money they have in other pension schemes back home, we can help them do that so that... Uh, they can have their retirement designed where they will retire. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tadeo, for that. I hope you have had Al, but I don't know if you're planning to 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 die and leave that and and, and not come back home uh, for your final journey. Uh, I know that is an African uh, conversation we don't like talking about uh, death and uh, us, <laughs> us going, uh, you know, planning for our dignified final journey. Uh, I brought that up because he just talked about the fact that you can change your, 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 your monies in different uh, saving schemes back, back home. So we need to think about that. How, also, I want to, you know, Gold earlier mentioned that uh, people are not interested in uh, life insurance even uh, but also mentioned even miriam noah you also mentioned the same uh, but then we have a big big problem when people fall sick abroad and uh, unfortunately die there's a huge problem my question is 
why die and leave your family indebted when you could have done something better? I want to begin with you, Noah. What, now we're heading into solutions. I'm glad that uh, Tadeo ushered us into a couple of solutions. I want us to dive into solutions to the challenges that we have highlighted. Uh, why die and leave your family in debt and leave your family in trouble, leave your family hanging and, and, and struggling, repatriating your body is costing he heaven and earth. And sometimes they have no way of repatriating one's body and ABCD. So uh, I want us to look at solutions to uh, avoid those uh, eventualities, especially in regard to life insurance and, and, and uh, savings. I want to start with you, Noah. So Lynn and uh, other panelists, uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, I mean, like, you know, I'm here because of uh, community service. Um, I've uh, helped several people, like, you know, move from uh, being renters to home ownership. Uh, I just had somebody close on the house. They were able to get 5%. Um, now, like, you know, down payment assistance, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the, the thing is, is uh, like Albert said, it's like, you know, uh, tapping into the community is like really key uh, and, uh, and building meaningful relationships. So, um, like, you know, the way I got into community service was by, I got here and uh, I wanted to tap into this community and the people were very friendly, but uh, uh, I, one of the things that I encountered was like, you know, uh, either they did not have uh, like, you know, the good information to share with me. So they were apprehensive in providing information. I made a few mistakes, uh, like, you know, uh, when I was going to school, I, uh, like, you know, the year I was graduating, I was trying to, to, to buy a house and uh, somehow uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't materialize. So uh, when I was going to school, there are things that I should have done um, at differently. Like, say, for example, there are classes I should have taken from a community college instead of going to, uh, like, you know, a fully uh, fledged uh, college, four-year college, uh, because it would have been cheaper. But... Um, that information was, uh, was uh, not forthcoming. And uh, uh, when I, I began to accumulate this knowledge, uh, mistakes made because, because I didn't know, but I was just trying my best. I said, I think I need to give back. And that is how I, I get into community service. And uh, we volunteer a lot of time. Uh, and, uh, and like... Uh, God, I was saying, yeah, is all we are trying to do is to empower people. We are trying to give them that financial knowledge so they can make the right decisions, so they don't make the mistakes that we made, or they they don't miss the opportunities that we missed. Because um, when I, I think uh, uh, Tadeo was talking about accumulation and then appreciation, right? Uh, the way the system operates here is like you know it's, it's it's like you know when you get into investing early then you're gonna end up like you know accumulating and later on actually realizing the appreciation uh much much faster so and and that is the concept that we are trying to tell people like if you start early the outcomes are gonna be much 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 better and uh, and I, I think Gilda touched on instant graphic, uh, gratification, right? Uh, they get quick rates. It doesn't work here. Uh, like, you know, I keep telling folks that it doesn't work. You have to be frugal. You have to be nimble. You have to be deliberate in making these, uh, in making these uh, like, you know, these uh, decisions. Like, I got to put money in the 401k. I got to, uh, like, you know, we also have, um, uh, Gilda is in life insurance and she will tell you, I keep telling folks, World Financial Group has got a very good uh, insurance product that somebody can utilize because uh, I, I do own a policy myself uh, from World Financial Group. And I keep telling folks, like, you know, these are the things that you have got to do. Uh, 
Miriam talked about like, you know, people have got temporary jobs. That is no excuse because the government still allows you the opportunity to, uh, to do what? To open your own individual retirement account, right? Uh, where you can put up to this year, I think it is going to be 7,000. It used to be 6,000. You can be able to save 6,000 and invest 6,000 on your own. But even at these places of your work, if you, it is going to make it easy for you. If you sign up for a 401k there, I don't care. Even if you save six months over there and you leave, you can transfer those assets to your individual retirement account. These are the opportunities that are there. But the greatest problem that we have is that people come and they bond in these, uh, uh, these cliques sometimes that do not help them. And, uh, and, and like, uh, when sometimes uh, people like us, Bakasara, uh, Golda are trying to talk to them, all they are thinking that we are being elitists or we are not understanding uh, their problems that they are going through. I think that is one of the, the greatest challenge for us that uh, uh, are trying to reach out, trying to, uh, to tell people. And uh, it is kind of tough. So some of us, we have tried several things like, you know what, I'm not going, I'm going to like, you know, try to like, you know, make some jokes with them, bring myself to their level so I can be able to, to penetrate and, and be able to talk the same language. But uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that we have. Uh, but also the, uh, the chance that I have had working with the community is also understanding uh, that um, people come here at different ages. So somebody can, uh, uh, can get here when they are in, in their forties. Uh, and, uh, like, you know, the way that person is going to approach life is, is going to be different. So that means, like, you know, uh, even us who are in, uh, uh, in community service, it's like, you know, uh, we need to point them at, uh, like, you know, to the right people and also share with them the right information so they can better, like, you know, prepare. So like uh, uh, today was talking about, uh, like, you know, the the uh nssf uh like you know i'll be honest with you if somebody got here in their mid 40s right and they have extra resources to put in uh, in a for uh, in uh, in uh, nssf that would be a best investment because guess what like he said it's 10 percent when i put my money in a 401k uh the growth is going to be between probably seven and ten percent uh, annually, and uh, most likely when I am in my uh, mid forties, I am going to pivot towards a conservative portfolio. Which, in that case, it means that I am going to end up realizing less than probably even between uh, seven to ten percent. So. So those are some of the things that are uh, uh, like, I think uh, like, you know, we need to kind of uh, 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 share with the community, like, hey, uh, maybe there are also these other good resources, like say in Uganda, uh, which you can, uh, you can be able to take advantage of if you're talking to somebody who is in their mid forties. Now I'll be honest with you, for somebody who is in their twenties, early thirties, it's like, you know, if they, just put their money, like say, like uh, in in a four hundred one k in uh, a, a good life insurance uh, program. Absolutely, they are gonna do fantastic. They they will be because, like you know, their returns are gonna be higher because they are not investing conservatively. They are a little bit aggressive, so they are going to see uh, like you know a good return on their investment. So. So that's kind of like, you know, what I can share is like, you know, it's just understanding our community. Uh, like, you know, I tell people like not everybody uh, like, you know, has to be a homeowner, but like, you know, there are those advantages that uh, home ownership is going to afford you. You're going to build equity. That means like, you know, hey, when you wake up and you say you want to go to Uganda, you can sell that house and you can get all the money out of that house and, and go with it in Uganda. Uh, rather than uh, building a house like we say it uh, uh, back in the village, it, it, it's, it's not going to help you. It's like, you know, but here, 
uh, your interest rate that you're getting uh, on your house is like 4%, 5%. Uh, like, you know, that is the interest rate on housing here. So that is good. So just make sure you get a house that you can afford and then you can begin to accumulate that equity over time. So when you decide to pack your bags, you can get that equity and go home. So that's kind of like, you know, like what I would share a little bit of like, you know, from okay. understanding the community and uh, from what I have seen. All right. Thank you very much, Noah, for that. Uh, Golda, we, you have heard from uh, Albert, you've heard from uh, Noah, you've heard from Miriam, you've also heard from Tadeo. Uh, how we're now seeking for solutions. We have all seen these challenges. We're seeking solutions. And we need to, instead of having uh, normal conversations, I think we need to move on to action. How do we move forward? What do we focus on right now? Okay, thank you so much. This discussion is really, really insightful. You know, when you listen and you're hearing some things for the first time, uh, for the NSSF idea, I think I'm really going to push to market it on our different platforms where I normally go and teach and minister because a number of our people, especially people who are 50 years and above, do not want to retire here. So I think they could really use that, yeah. So for me, some of the solutions, I think, number one is for financial interest, like I had said in the beginning. And then number two is for people to get proper insurance, not just life insurance, but also proper insurance of on health, because that can also, uh, uh, having no or little health insurance here can easily uh, leave one so indebted and probably into bankruptcy. Uh, having proper insurance on your car. If you do not have insurance on your car, you know the time we're on the road, uh, morning, evening, moving up and down, something small happens and you could lose everything you have ever worked for. That's the American system. The system was created in a way that insurance here is the foundation. Insurance on your house, on your car, on your health, on your life, on everything, on where you're renting, wherever. If you do not have insurance, proper insurance, here it is one straight key to bankruptcy or one key to high debt. Like for life insurance, by the way, our community normally associates it with uh, just final expense. But when you're looking at, at life insurance, final expenses, even like in finance, they do not really consider like the American system. These people will work hard and uh, the, like uh, mostly the Caucasian community and the Indians, they work hard, they go, they pay the funeral home, they work hard, they go buy their small plot. They do not quantify that in life insurance. Life insurance here does four major things. Number one, it helps pay the debts that you leave behind because if you have debt and you do not have either assets that can be um, that can be liquidated to pay or proper life insurance. When they report death here, the very first people they notify by law. Because by the way, I'm also a paralegal student. I'm doing my degree, I'm almost done. That by law, they notify the people who are uh, your creditors before they even help your family. So if you, you can imagine if you are collecting money from the community to take someone home, what's going to happen to their debts behind? So life insurance, first and foremost, ensures that the debts someone leaves behind are paid so that they are not uh, inherited by the estate. Number two, it helps give income to the family for at least three to six years. That right now, even in Uganda, there is life insurance. We should take advantage of these modern ways of managing money. I was um, sharing with a group that the way we handle life insurance in our community, especially here in the Boston area, is the way life insurance was handled in 100 BC in the Roman Empire. Can you imagine? 
that's where people would come, you know, give just a small bit of money for you to go and be buried. They used to do it for the Roman soldiers. So, how many years ahead, we are duplicating it in our community and shockingly with all the knowledge that we need in our surrounding. So the income bit is very, very important because like I was saying, if someone has assets back home and the children are here, it will be very hard for those children to depend on the income collected there, even if the assets are doing very well. So the income should be at least covering the family for three to six years. They believe that at least in three to six years, the family has stabilized and they can move on. And then the mortgage. Uh, Albert, for you, you've been here in the community for some good time. Ugandans buy those gigantic houses, you know, 10 bedroom house. Most of the rooms are even empty when they hold parties, you know, people, their friends who are drunk and can't sleep there. But it is much more important to look at the end in mind, like making sure that that house where we are holding the parties, we are taking photos, actually remains as an asset in our family. So that is the third use of life insurance. It should be able to cover the mortgage debt if someone has a house. And then life insurance should also be able to cover unforeseen expenses like uh, children's education. That's life insurance. Whatever else I see being talked about in the community, I've tried to address a number of leaders and somehow, somewhere, either, I don't know, but they, they kind of like brush me off. But it is not doing a service to our people if we know the right thing, but we are still marketing to them something that we know is useless. So that is life insurance. If we, we can invest some of these policies are very cheap, like term insurance could even go below $30 a month. So if we could really insure ourselves properly, and not just as adults, even kids. We have seen uh, some families that have been unfortunate to lose kids, and they collect at least a substantial amount of money that can take them for some good period of time. Or even using those policies, like uh, the banker was saying, <laughs> I forget his name, uh, like uh, Noah was saying uh, that these, some of these policies have cash value, like uh, our brokerage has a pool of over 40 companies, uh, but some of the companies like Transamerica, Prudential, Nationwide, John Hancock, uh, Fidelity have policies that have cash that grows at a very, very good rate, like above 9%, and it's also tax advantage. That's what I've also, by the way, liked about the NSSF product. Wherever you're growing your money and you're not paying tax, you're, you're doing yourself a very good service, you know? Yeah, so we should really take advantage of life insurance and then we should plan for retirement early. I normally share again different platforms. I have a friend who's 74 years old here. She's still picking shifts. 74, you find, you know, some people are like, but we cannot employ you. You could break your back. You know, you could injure the patient, but she has no way out. She sent all her life savings to her sons in Uganda and they defrauded her to zero. Hmm? So if we start investing early and investing in proven things, like for NSSF, I've saved with them for some time before I moved here. So I know. I know like it really works. That is something I could do with my whole heart because I was putting in just a little bit of money. But when I was moving here, I had almost 50 million. I was surprised. And like I was saying, and uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, Tadeo was saying, the shocking bit is that when I got that money, I was financially literate and I blew it up all gone gone in a very short period of time. The moment, you know, I called relatives telling them, oh, my sisters, my what, I got money. One would come up with a problem of $500, another one, 5,000, whatever, gone. So I really think if we start early, that if you see these uh, white people, the Bazungu and the Indians, 
they start saving for retirement, even for their kids. Their kids, they pay them some small little bit of money and they open for them uh, Roth IRA accounts or other retirement accounts that qualify for the kids and they are giving them some small bit of income. By the time the child is starting to work, they already have something to build on. But in our community, we are holding our, for our children parties, very expensive. My child has new teeth, my child is this, my child is that, you know, baby shower this, gender reveal. As we are wasting the money in instant gratification, time is not waiting. So we reach a certain age, we start to work, and then we discover now we are going into student loans. So I think retirement would be best if we start as early as possible, not waiting for, for us to really reach like 30s and 40s, and then we are like, oh, we, we need to retire. And then another solution that I think that could really work well for our diaspora communities, wherever we are, is to plan for our children early. And not only planning for them in time of money, but also investing time into their talents. Because talents are one good way of paying for college here in the USA. But you find people working day and night. They just buy their children tablets, laptops, and get house help. That's it. They ignore something which could have helped their child grow, you know, talent-wise, while also competing for non-monetary ways of paying for college, or even helping them increase their grades. For me, for my degree, I'm an A student. You know, Albert, you've been here for some good time. Here, once you perform so well and you join those honors clubs, you don't have to pay for school. The scholarships come to you first before they go anywhere else. So investing time in our children, investing for them early, would also help, you know, uh, kind of mitigate future, uh, future stories or conversations like this. And then uh, lastly, what I think, no, the second last point, let us learn as a community to work with professionals. It is very, very important. I have told people time and again that even if um, if I have a small idea, let me say about stocks, but I'm not a professional in that line, I might not be able to see something that someone who's qualified with the licenses will be able to see. So we also have that... Uh, big hurdle that I think would be solved by we changing our mindset to trusting these professionals that they really uh, have that fiduciary duty to do for us what is best. Because at the end of the day, you're trusting your, your money with someone. We have had the, the latest scam where people lost so much money here in Boston. People gave their money to someone, $1,400, each one of them hundreds and hundreds of people. And because this person was not a professional and the bank was seeing his account, people, different people depositing, depositing, they froze everything, you know? So we should learn to use professionals because they know best what we do not know. And lastly, we should think of having estate plans. Mm -hmm. Albert, you're the leaders here in the community. Try to talk to our people to have proper wills, at least those who are building wealth. I see we have so many here, especially here in Boston, people are buying rental buildings, they are buying all kinds of things. Let us have proper estate plans where, you know, someone has a will that is properly written, properly signed and notarized where the person has a trust, if they have like a lot of wealth or, you know, or if they're able to afford and it can save them a lot, uh, where they know they have like health directives written and signed properly. You know, we know if so-and-so is in hospital and he or she is unable to speak, what do we do? Whom do we call? These are modern things. This is how we are supposed to really manage our finances. And lastly, financial powers of attorney. 
even for the things we have back home in Kampala. I have a friend who has been building assets in Uganda, but the mother was the one managing. When the mother died, the family back home did not even contact her. They have sold everything. Let us have proper estate plans, clearly indicating what happens to what we are building here and what happens to what we are building at home and who is in charge and what can be done if the people we are vesting our trust in, if they do not do what we hope they are going to do for us. So for me, I think that is the way forward for our community. But like for me, I go there wherever I'm called upon, short notice, long-term notice, I'm always there. I educate, I educate because I know knowledge, you cannot go wrong. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you very much, Golda, for those wonderful insights. Uh, and uh, uh, as you end estate plans, as you concluded your your your, your input, uh, estate plans, I think, is one of those big challenges we have around, even here in Uganda. It's not only just uh, for our Ugandan diaspora. Uh, I, I want to. Uh, quickly run to you, Albert and Miriam, as we wind up. But I want to start with uh, Albert. Albert, I'm giving you five minutes. Uh, the, the, we have a mentality. I think it's a cultural issue that we don't discuss death. We don't discuss estate plans. You know, we don't discuss uh, life. We don't. We, we just live in the moment. And we keep saying that our people, you know, my people, my family, friends will take care of me in any eventuality. And from what God has told us, things don't look good at all. People are going to, you know, work your, work, uh, swindle your stuff and, and eventually you'll, there'll be nothing for you. So uh, Albert in five minutes as a wind up. What do we do? How do we move forward from this mentality, from this cultural, uh, I don't know, brokehead or cultural, I don't know what we can call it. It's, it's a taboo to talk death, to talk estate plans before we die. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you, Golda, for <laughs> that was good. That, that was good. Um, so to piggyback on what uh, Golda is saying and the, the solutions, the solutions are there, but one is going to start with us, uh, I mean, not to start with us, but to continue with us, because we've been doing this work as community leaders. We need to continue. We can't give up on our people. Um, we need to give this uh, information out there, and Lynn, you're doing a great job, and hopefully we go ahead and uh, send out this information, this uh, uh, tape to, to, to every, the, record, the recording to every place that we can so people can hear this information. Uh, Golda pretty much covered everything. So I will just try to plug some holes, in, 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 not, not holes per se, but some of, of the things that we just uh, brushed over quickly. We talked about mostly on this session, we talked about mostly about in, investing for financial literacy, but we didn't really go deep in the two uh, um, main components of financial literacy. Uh, yes, we talked about income generation, but the two common components are income generation and debt management. So we talked a little slightly more about uh, income generation and, um, and, and wealth management, all that stuff that fall under there. But we did not talk about debt management. It's very important for our community. Debt. When we come, and uh, Golda talked about instant gratification, when you come and get here, whether it's student loan, where we find our people getting, when, when, once you have papers, you're you are eligible for a student loan. Instead of borrowing only what you need, people go, oh, by the time I finish school, I'll probably get a job. And then you end up taking up more than you should have. Uh, a little, you build a little bit of equity in the home. And uh, oh, let me take the equity out and, 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 and buy it. Uh, this nice expensive car or buy a plot that uh, my, 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 my cousin told me about in, 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 in Wakiso. Those kind of things are on debt management. The interest rates matter. Credit scores here, we, we do have, that, that's part, the biggest component of, of credit management is credit score. What are your credit scores? How do you manage your debt? If you manage your debt, you could even have, if you manage your debt well, you could even have free money to just play around with. Every 
day, I opened my mail and there uh, uh, checks uh, uh, from credit cards. I said, oh, Albert, you can take $10,000 out of this card at zero interest rate for 20 months. Imagine that. You can take this money out. 20. Why? Because I have carefully built my credit over the years. If you have a little bit of liquidity in your home, leave it in there. Golda talked about investing in your children. Please do. Why don't you have college funds for your kids? Uh, when we're here, my little one, um, yes, I'm still having kids. <laughs> my three-year-old came and, uh, and said hi. But those kids have college funds. They have ins life insurance at two. Because at two, it's the cheapest. He has a, a policy, he's the latest one, he has a policy of $50,000 up to 20 years. From 20 years, that will be building equity and he will never have to pay a single penny. That policy is there. He will just keep accumulating funds into his old age. So uh, once he turns 20, I'm done with him. He gets, leaves my house, but he doesn't live empty-handed. He lives with, by then, it will probably be $100,000 in that policy. So do that. College fund. Why not? We have the money now. We are working. Why not put $100 in a kid's college fund now? So by the time they go to college, they don't do, have to do what we do to suffer the way we suffered. I had to take out student loans. I mean, I don't regret it because they've opened education. It was another thing that we, we could put in this component that opens doors here in the U.S. Our people come and instant gratification. They don't go to school. They don't. But these opportunities are there. You have to better, like I said, income generation and debt management. On the income generation side is when we talk about employment, education, and the other things that build you to have a, a, a constant stream of income. Okay, but mostly. It, it, the important uh, the emphasis I wanted to put was on um, debt management. We are so indebted. We are so, our people are drowning in debt, and it's not really because it's just that they don't know how to manage it. But a key component is making sure: do you pay your bills on time? Do you when you get a little credit card, don't borrow money and then you go and give it away. So you are, they're waiting for you in Kampala and you reach out there and you, <laughs> you're spending money on your credit card and you come back from a Christmas holiday and you've blown $5,000. Now you're struggling to pay it back. And by the time you know it, your credit has moved, your credit score has moved from 700, now it's 300. And now when you go to buy a car, instead of paying 3%, you're paying 12%, 15%. 20%. That translates into money. Okay? That difference between paying a, month, a, a car note of $500 and paying $800, that's $300. That's a whole million that, that you pay every month because you did not manage your credit well. So those are some of the things we can do. But again, in, uh, in the solutions category, as community leaders, Golda, please do not do, do not despair, okay? I've been there where you are, when, especially when I was in Yuna. I used to have these stupid schemes where, oh, do $15,000 and they can take your body home. And then what happens after that? What happens? If you are an able-bodied person, okay? My, my cell phone bill in this house uh, for the three cell phones is about $200. My, 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 I'm going to watch Arsenal about to play. My, my, my cable bill is $170. Why wouldn't I pay $50 for insurance and have half a million dollars? Why wouldn't I? I usually joke with my wife here every time I'm sick and say, oh, how are you feeling? I was like, well, where do you worry? If I die, you'll be sick. I mean, you'll be uh, uh, rich. <laughs> you'll be rich. And I mean it. Honestly, I mean, I say it jokingly. And these are the things we don't talk about because of our, uh, our Ugandan-ness. So we don't talk about death. I do in my household. I, I even joke about it. Say, hey, if I die today, why would you care? You're going to be a really rich woman. You probably will have somebody living in my house. and uh, huh? Because I have to have that kind of insurance, not the $15,000 that some of our Ugandan people are selling. No, my life insurance is to the tune of almost a million dollars because I have... Albert, your time is up. 
I have kids. I have to make sure they're protected if I go today. But yes, mm -hmm. I had the same situation. They pushed back with Golda. Oh, you are an elite. And I don't make any apologies. I was not. I didn't come here as an elite. I've done every other job you can think of. Okay, so I don't apologize for where I am, but I also cannot take it and say, you know what? Oh, yeah, they're saying I'm an elite, so I cannot give that advice. The best thing is that when you are able to work, protect yourself, protect your family, leave something. Don't okay. leave them hanging when you leave. Thank okay. you so much, Lynn. All right. Thank you very much. We are racing against time. And uh, now, Miriam, you have the floor as we wind up. You... What, how do we move forward? Do we continue having these conversations? Do we change uh, our approach to these conversations? But because we notice that there is more work needed to be done. Yes. So Miriam. Yeah, yes, sure. And there is a lot of work need to be done, but uh, these conversations are very important. I hope uh, we keep having them on this forum and other forums. And I want to call upon uh, Tadeo NSSF since uh, a national agency, since uh, they they uh, tried to reach out to the diaspora community, I think that's a good initiative, but how many people know about that? It's like lighting a candle and putting it in a basket. I don't know, there are so many initiatives in Uganda, even different banks have different initiatives. There is also the capital markets, the Bank of Uganda securities. There are so many, uh, opportunities with the Uganda Investment Authority, which uh, the diaspora community could invest in easily, but uh, it's like the government is not putting in that extra gear that is needed uh, to, to communicate about them and, and reach out to the right people with the right information. And, and Tadeo, please take note that not all, all diaspora people don't understand English. So when you are sending that information, I check on all the websites of Uganda. There is no, no program that is put in local language. Most Ugandans know Uganda, know Swahili. Honestly, this is, this is a very big concern. We know English of saying, how are you, please? But we don't know financial English. We don't understand the banking language. So try to break down all that information in local languages. It doesn't hurt. I think we have a, a colonial mentality of saying like everything has to be English and then it stays with the elite groups and the, the people who really need knowledge don't access it. They look at it, they, they can see your brochure, but are they going to understand what you are saying there? And that's how we miss out on opportunities. So next time, at least to look for the main two, three, put in Swahili, put in Luganda here and there, and then reach out to so many people that would need your services. Uh, but thank you so much for responding to our call and educating us. It was a great opportunity. And I hope next time we call upon you with Gorda. With, uh, we really learned a lot from you, Noah, uh, Albert. I appreciate you, all of you, and Lynn. Today was very educative, and I hope we have similar discussions in future. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Why I concluded with Miriam is that she, you know, puts this together and uh, we get to sit and have conversations that we ought to have every other single time. I want to thank you very much, Golda, uh, Tadeo, Albert, Miriam, and Noah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we ought to have more of these conversations. And I urge you, uh, especially Tadeo, whenever you have any conversations in regard to diaspora, we are here. We are always available just to reach out to us. And we shall have the platform available for, for our diaspora Ugandans. You have something to say? Yes, Lynn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, one, I've taken, I've taken note of the request from Miriam, and the other one we are going to incorporate in all our communications. Uh, just like she said, we have just taken it for granted that everyone who stays in America understands only English. But yes, it's very important to have these people touch base with their local languages. I just want to conclude with only three aspects. One, uh, to first of all, console my friend Golda. It's okay you ate your money, but the good thing is you ate it at a young age, so you have a lot of time to recover, and I know you are going to do it. So very, very soon, you are just part of the 80% of Ugandans 
who are getting financial literacy from their relatives. You know, many of you consult your wife or husband in bed and poof, you are making a financial decision. So let's learn the habit of talking to financial experts so that they can help us, coach us uh, into a better life. Um, then the other thing is, as Ugandans, especially in the diaspora and elsewhere, let's make sure that we accept our problem that we inherited. We, we are not very good at saving. So let us save in areas which don't allow us to withdraw every time we want. Now, that's the only reason people have a lot of money in NSSF, because the, for them to get that money out, just imagine when COVID happened, they wanted to blow the entire fund out. However, we had to be very, very careful, craft a law of that can help us mitigate such similar occurrences in the future. So let's save money in places where we do not have, you know, uh, the liberty to pick it any because otherwise then it is not a saving. Eh? Uh, then just one more advice from the people to the people in the diaspora. I have a, a brother who recently got a loan of 900 million. I think he works in the US somewhere and he came and bought a, a, and built apartments. I asked him, what is the income you are looking at every year? And he told me, no, these apartments are going to give me a total of 6 million per month. That sounds great, but that is if you are working with faithful tenants. In Uganda, trust me, if you are targeting 6 million, you only get 3 million. Now, on a loan of sincerely 900 million, if this person had consulted financial experts, I would have advised them, even not to, even if he doesn't buy a bond in Uganda, place that money in a municipal bond in Nairobi, which is going to give you a 16% return. On average, that person would have got, say, 140-something million per year, which is around 12 or 13 million per month without any hassle. And then he can struggle to pay that loan back home, sorry, wherever he is, but when he knows it is substantially working for him. Remember, at the expiration of this bond, he will have recouped all that interest, but also his money will be there, and therefore he can plan his retirement around that area. So there is a lot we can share, and the Golda and all the team here, even me, like I will be inviting you in the event that we have an opportunity, please invite NSSF to speak to those people where they have doubts so that they can hear from the, uh, their boss's mouth. Thank you very much, and have a blessed I don't know whether morning, as we are almost going into the evening. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Tadeo. That's very key. Very, very important. So, Golda, Miriam, Noah, and Albert, and myself, we are available for you, Tadeo, uh, and also available for anybody out there that would like to uh, have this conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. I think, Miriam, we need now to bring it down to uh, insurance, to the, 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 the particulars, yeah? Uh, next time, we need to break it down and, and really have the concrete conversations. So thank you very much. I wish you all a lovely weekend and we will catch you again next time.